The perceptron algorithm is one of the earliest uh, sort of learning algorithms that look very similar to modern machine learning algorithms that we use for, say, learning you know, neural networks today. Um, in this unit, we'll look at the perceptron algorithm itself. We'll look at a few variants and we'll spend quite a bit of time proving that the perceptron algorithm is a mistake bound algorithm. In other words, it makes only a finite number of mistakes. So let's start with the algorithm itself. I'll introduce the algorithm today, kind of give you uh, maybe an intuitive idea for what the algorithm is. Hopefully that's where we'll stop today. Just to kind of set the stage, um, a linear classifier, we've seen this a few lectures ago, is uh, another name for a linear classifier is a linear threshold unit, sometimes LTU. It is defined using a weight vector W and a bias, a real number. And it operates on uh, inputs which are themselves vectors. So both the weight vector and the input vectors should be d dimensional. And the label is a minus one or a plus one. The way it predicts is it takes the dot product or W transpose X, the dot product of W and X, adds a bias, you get a number. If that number is positive, the label is one. If that number is negative, the label is zero. And the term B is called the bias term. In one of the earlier lectures, I already talked about how we can lose the term B by folding it into the weights. And that's the notation I'll use in the rest of this lecture. Sometimes you see pictures like this for linear classifiers. Uh, this is kind of reminiscent of a neural network-ish thing where each circle here is a feature. The wires carry the feature to this unit here. And when you travel along the wire, you multiply by the weight. So W1 gets multiplied with X1 and all those things. The number one gets multiplied with the bias. And you have a sum, which is W transpose X plus B. And you take the sign and you get a, a plus one or a minus one. The linear classifier, just to kind of remind you again, has an, uh, a sort of an intuitive geometry. It's the linear classifier is defined, defines a line in two dimensions, a plane in three dimensions, and a hyperplane in D dimension. This hyperplane slices the instant space into two parts and says one side is positive and the other side is negative. It's a linear surface that slices uh, the instant space. Before we move into the percept, move on to the perceptron algorithm, just make, just to make sure we are all on the same page. Any questions about uh, this term? Everyone knows what a linear classifier is, and we can start proving theorems about them. But before that, um, the perceptron algorithm was introduced in this paper with that name by uh, Frank Rosenblatt. Uh, it's from 1960, 1958. And uh, I had this rather, I like the title, um, the perceptron, a perceiving and recognizing automaton, a probabilistic model for inst information storage and organization in the brain. I wish I had the confidence to write such title. But anyway, so, uh, this, uh, this was introduced in 1958, and it really caught the public imagination. I mean, we're talking, there were New York Times articles about, uh, you know, we are going to have machines that are that will walk and talk among us in the next few years. That's how uh, wildly popular this algorithm was. Um, turns out that this idea existed, meaning the algorithm itself, without the name, it was showed up in a few papers before Rosenblatt's 58 paper. In particular, if you're interested, I encourage you to check out uh, the papers, the authors in the very, very fine print there. Uh, this, these two papers appeared in a Canadian, Canadian journal in mathematics. I really had to dig this up. And uh, I know the algorithm. I knew that the papers had the algorithm. And yet it took me some effort to find it because it was presented as this mathematical curiosity rather than as a learning algorithm or as a model of the brain. It has a rather simple goal. Given a data set, the perceptron wants to find a, a hyperplane 
that separates out the positives and the negatives. Basically, it wants to find a linear classifier. And it comes with this amazing guarantee. If there exists any hyperplane that separates the positives and the negatives, then the perceptron algorithm is guaranteed to find one that agrees with it. In other words, if the data set that it encounters is linearly separable, the perceptron algorithm will definitely find some hyperplane that uh, perfectly classifies the training data. It's an online algorithm, meaning it processes examples one at a time. At least the initial version that Rosenblatt defined was an online algorithm. We'll see other versions that are more practical that you will implement in your homework that are not online. It's a mistake-driven algorithm in the sense that it makes changes to its internal state only when there's a mistake. It's a, uh, the perceptron is so old that it has been very widely studied and there are numerous, numerous variants and we'll see a few of them uh, later on. One of the really amazing things about the perceptron algorithm is how simple it is. The proof of how simple an algorithm is, is whether it can be fit on one slide. <laughs> and this one is so simple. So yeah, I'll walk you through this and then we'll kind of uh, yeah, go through this a few times uh, from, from different perspectives. The input to the algorithm is a sequence of uh, labeled examples, a sequence of training examples. I'm calling them x1, y1, in general, x, i, and y, i. x, i is a d dimensional real valued vector, a d dimensional feature vector. And y, i is a minus one or a plus one because we are still working with binary classification. The way the algorithm works is its internal state is this weight vector w that it keeps updating as we go along. In the first iteration, before actually, before the first iteration, the weight vector is set to the zero vector. Basically, all features have a zero weight. And then this is a mistake driven algorithm, right? Uh, this is an online algorithm. So, what examples come in one at a time. So we are currently, imagine we are currently working with this example, xi comma yi. We have this one example, xi. So first, like any other mistake-driven algorithm, it has to make a prediction. The way it predicts is like any linear classifier. It takes the dot product of the weight and the current feature, the current weight and the current input, and checks is that dot product positive or negative? If so, and uh, if it's positive, the label is plus one, if it's negative, the label is minus one, and we'll call that prediction uh, y prime. Y prime is the prediction from the uh, from the current model. We already have the true label y i. If y prime is not the same as y i, then what it does is it, it applies the famous perceptron update. The perceptron update is so simple. All you have to do is you have your existing weights w. You have your features of the current example xi. You multiply the features with the current label yi. You have this r, which is a constant that we are not going to worry about right now. You basically just add a, a scaled version of the current input to the current weight. So remember, xi is a vector. So it looks something like has a bunch of numbers, and yi is either it looks like minus one or plus one. And this quantity here is another vector. So you're just adding the w uh, the, to the current weights, wt, you're adding yi xi scaled by r. And you that's it. This is the entire update. And uh, of course, the more interesting part is what it does and whether it works. It keeps doing this. Eventually, when this algorithm run out, runs out of examples, it returns the final weight vector. This is the entire perceptron algorithm. Um, remember that the prediction I've written here, it has a sign of W transpose X, WT transpose XI, uh, but there's typically a bias term. And I'm assuming the convention that the bias term is part of the input feature, as we have agreed to do in one of the previous lectures. Another thing to note here is uh, I'm using minus one and plus one here for false and true. Um, in some cases, you have zero and one. Sometimes it is false and true. For perceptron, it's going to be convenient to treat false as minus one and true as plus one. Um, 
let's kind of unfold this perceptron update. If the true label yi is a positive, uh, is positive, meaning the example is a positive example, then what you do is let's zoom in a bit. Then what you do is you are adding the current example to the current weights with a scale r. If the true label is negative, so I'll write the update here, wt plus one is wt plus r yi xi. So if yi is negative, we're saying, take it away, take that weight vector, the, the, those features away from the weights. So you're subtracting from the current weights, you're subtracting r times xi. So you're adding positive examples and removing negative examples. That's, that's the entire update. Um, and then the other sort of practical thing here is there's this R. R is called the learning rate. Sometimes it's also called the step size. It's when we are adding or subtracting these positive or negative examples, it's how much influence should each example have? That's what R does. So R is a small positive number. And for uh, reasons that we won't get into right now, uh, assume that R is a number that's less than one. This is a mistake driven algorithm, which means the weights get updated if and only if the prediction, which is y prime, is not equal to the ground truth yi. And uh, here I've kind of written these two separate things yi and, uh, you know, first you make a prediction and then you check. These two steps can be combined by saying if yi times w transpose xi is less than or equal to zero. Can someone tell me why this one step basically update? Can someone tell me why this one step is the same as these two steps? Uh, not you, because you've already spoken two times today. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, that's the, that's the right answer. So remember that the weights, tra weights transpose X, let me write this down slightly more. So the goal, we make a prediction. I'm dropping this, the T here. here. Now, suppose you consider two cases. If yi is, um, now let's consider w transpose xi and yi. If this is positive, then y prime is plus one by definition. By If this is negative, y prime is minus one, right? That's literally the definition of the sign function. Now, in each of these cases, we can have, this can be a plus one or a minus one, and this can be a plus one or a minus one. Now consider the case, when, does, when, when do we have a mistake? We have a mistake when this happens or when this happens, when yi is not the same as w transpose, uh, the yi is not the same as y prime. But instead of saying this quantity uh, is not the same, I could multiply this with W transpose xi, some positive number. Multiplying a minus with a positive number leaves you with, so let's say, i. So let's consider two cases here. There's a mistake and no, oh wow, this is so ugly. So we have these four rows. Uh, there's a minus one. Let's put a plus one here so that we complete it. So when, when yi and y prime are both positive, this quantity is greater than zero because yi times w transpose xi, you're multiplying two positive numbers. When they have opposite signs, this quantity is less than zero. Here they have less than zero, and this is still positive because you're multiplying two negative numbers. So in other words, whenever yi w transpose xi is negative, there's a mistake. So this is 
a convenient way of writing that there's a mistake for a linear classifier, for a linear binary classifier. This is why we use, why didn't anyone tell me this was so small? <laughs> um, should I go over this again, or is this not worth the time? I'm happy to do it. I'm happy to go over it again. We have a few minutes. Yes. That's right. That's yes. If y i w transpose x i, the only time it gets negative is when the signs of the two y's don't match. I'm not going to do this again because this is slightly boring. Uh, and you can kind of work it out by enumerating these four cases. And also it's kind of worth thinking about this because it forces you to think about the mechanism for the prediction. The last thing I want to say for today is um, that the perceptron algorithm is, th this is the original version of the perceptron algorithm that uh, Rosenblatt introduced. And uh, there are many, many variants, as I said, and we'll see some of them. There's a minute left, and I don't want to start talking about the intuitive explanation, but I want you to kind of, before we start on Tuesday, I want you to kind of uh, go over this, just the algorithm, and think about why that update rule is reasonable. Why, why is it that it actually you know, why might Rosenblatt have invented this? It's, you know, it's not a discovery, it's an invention. You could have had, you know, this update could have taken any, any of different forms. The question for you to think about is why is this reasonable? And perhaps the most uh, productive way to think about that is to think about the geometry of these objects here. <clears throat> Remember, the weight vector is a hyperplane, is a line. Think about it in two dimensions. What's happening when you're adding this point to a line and what, what happens to the line? We'll start with that in the next lecture. And uh, in the meanwhile, look out for a homework. That homework will cover linear classifiers, online learning, and you'll be implementing perceptron, which uh, by Tuesday, you'll all be experts on.